comes in the name of the Lord. Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. It's always someone else's kids until it's yours. When our next guest and her husband found out their son was using heroin, the responses ran the gamut, disbelief, anger, helplessness, guilt, as they struggled to come to grips with their son's addiction and decide how best to help him, their home became a refuge for an unlikely assortment of their son's friends, each with their own story, drawn by the simple love and acceptance they found there. In this sensitive, vulnerable memoir, award-winning novelist Catherine James turns her lush prose to a new purpose, to tell her family's story through the twist and turns of her son's addiction, overdose, and slow recovery. The result is not just a look at the phenomenon of drug abuse in suburban America, but also a meditation on the particular anguish of loving a wayward child and clinging to a desperate trust in God's providence through it all. Catherine James received the Felipe P. de Alba Fellowship from Columbia University, where she also taught undergraduate fiction. Her debut novel, Can You See Anything Now, won Christianity Today's 2018 Fiction Book Award and was a semifinalist for the Doris Bakken Award. She lives in Westchester, Pennsylvania with her husband, Rick. Here to talk about her new book, A Prayer for Orion, A Son's Addiction and a Mother's Love, is Catherine James. Catherine, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much for having me. Catherine, when, before we came on the air, I said something to you. I said, you are my hero. And you said, <laughs> well, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Uh, I grew up in a drug culture of the 60s and the early 70s. Had no meaning to us. We didn't consider anybody family, friends, weren't people getting arrested, people weren't really overdosing. Things have changed a lot, uh, both in the quality of what's available and the poison that's out there, that's gripping lives. Mm -hmm. And it is something mm -hmm. that the enemy will use in any way he can to destroy because it is something that is so insidious because it replicates brain chemistry. And because it represents brain chemistry, it only mimics endorphins which give us this euphoria. And it's surreal, it is an escape, and it's a place where there was pain, but now pain is gone. Whether were challenges, whether or not shame, abuse, identity crisis, all these things, this is the mask. And it's kind of become the mask of choice for so many. Mm. You have mm. a very unique experience in the fact that you devoted yourself in every way you could learning along the way, realizing how ill-equipped you are to even take the first step in grasping what it meant that my son is using heroin. Before we dig into a prayer for Orion, I'd kind of like to have the audience get to know you better. Your upbringing, sure. what role faith played, or what role mm -hmm. Faith didn't play, what examples you had, mm -hmm. what were your experiences mm -hmm. in uh, testing the boundaries of teenage life, of freedom going off to college, all those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your journey like? Yeah, well, you said you grew up mostly in the 70s, right? Yes. 60s and 60s, 70s, 60s, yeah. right. Well, I was probably 10 years behind you. So mostly 70s, 80s. So in the 80s, um, drugs were there, but it was more 
marijuana and some of the less, some more benign drugs, if you can call any drug benign, the heroin, the really hard stuff, I think crack, cocaine was just becoming popular. But these things were in the middle of the city. At least that's the way I saw things back then. You know, we wouldn't go near it. And so I had somewhat of a, at least the hard drugs. You know, I did some pot, uh, things like that. But the really hard stuff I was afraid of and I wouldn't really end up close to it anyway. So um, by the time I was in high school, you know, I had kind of come to this place where I realized that, you know, everything that I had been doing up until I was a sophomore, so it was pretty pointless. So I started seeking God. I grew up in a nominal Christian home. So, um, you know, I had this longing, I had this desire, uh, wasn't really a huge part partier, um, although I kind of go along with friends. So in college, I was about probably freshman, sophomore, somewhere along there, I, I started really seeking God got involved in a campus ministry called Crew, mm -hmm. and started to grow. And um, that was really, you know, where my life changed. And I, I know a lot of times when people start walking with God, it's more of a gradual thing. But I remember one particular day where it just was like, this is it. You have me, God. You have all of me. And I'm never going back. And uh, he's been faithful to keep me headed forward and not allow me to go back. So, um that's really where things changed. And then I married my husband actually very young. I was 20 years old. He was 21. So it was before I actually graduated from college. And then uh, we worked for about three years and then decided to go into ministry ourselves. So, When you met your husband uh, in college, what was that like? Uh, was it uh, through crew? Was he a part of, of that? Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, I walked into the first meeting, and he was actually doing the emceeing, and I thought, oh, he's kind of cute. I could marry him. <laughs> so I did. Uh, there were only maybe tops 30 people in the room, and I'd never really met a Christian guy for the most part. And I had, met, I had actually dated a lot of guys who were kind of meh, nah, um, weren't the nicest guys in the world. So when I met him, I was kind of blown away because he walked with God, and he had he too had just came to Christ. Um, so he was excited about this new relationship he had, and um, never met anybody who loved God as much as him. So, thankfully, even though we were married young, we've lasted. I know that the statistics aren't great for people who marry that young, but God has been gracious and uh, married a godly guy, so we're still married. So the culture in which you raised your children was a God-centered, church-centered, Christ-centered kind of home. Mm -hmm. Very, very. Yeah, we were in ministry, so our kids kind of saw the ins and outs. And, you know, I even if we didn't do it, everything right, I kind of always fell back on the fact that our kids were seeing what it looked like to walk with God because we were a very real family as far as spiritually you know it wasn't a fake only only Christian uh, Sundays kind of a thing or we didn't just do everything right but our hearts were just kind of uh, you know uh, not really all in when it came to Christ but our kids really saw what it meant to walk by faith and uh, so I was like oh we're good we're good our kids are never going to stray um, I thought we had it down for sure <laughs> So, and I'm going to ask this question for a very important reason because it is the number one reason that the millennials are not connecting with the church. Uh, did your kids see you read the Bible at home? Did they see you, their father read the Bible at home? Did they hear you pray together? So they saw this living example. Yeah, they saw a lot of it. They saw a lot of it. So, yeah, and, you know, I have to, when I look back, I think, you know, certainly we did things wrong. Definitely we did things wrong. But um, when it comes down to it, I think that a huge part of it was spiritual battle. You know, my husband was going out and, you know, telling people about Christ. He, was a, he spoke at a lot of conferences and things like that. And uh, I really believe, well, of course, like with anything in our lives, you know, Satan will kind of worm his way in and cause all sorts of chaos. And I think that that was a big part of it. 
um, that we were sort of attacked in that way. And I don't mean that to be, uh, you know, an excuse at all, because I'm sure that, you know, that along with all the things that we might have been able to see ahead of time if we were looking for things. But um, at least from my end, I think that there was pride involved. I know there was. And so our kids weren't going to do that. So I wasn't looking out for that at all. Kind of sideswiped when our child got into drugs. It's certainly natural that a parent would uh, look at themselves to say, what could I have done differently? But the truth of the matter is, Mm -hmm. is that uh, at the point in which your son got involved, he was someone who was trained and knew right and wrong, and he was making decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, in Judaism, we have this uh, rite of passage of bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, which is a time where... Uh, a young person comes into their own in their relationship with God. And it's not to make an event, it's actually there's a prayer that the parents say over the children as they release them. And it says in this prayer that uh, up until this point in time, your father and I were responsible, your mother and I were responsible for Mm -hmm. everything. Your decisions, we were held accountable by God for but now you're coming out from under our covering and you're now responsible for your decisions before God. You know the word, you've been trained, you've been taught, it's been spoken to you. 13 years is a firm foundation. 3,000 years ago, that was the age of marriage. That was the age people were having children. So when we look at the culture of the Jewish world that I grew up in before I came to faith, uh, this was foundational. This was something that, this was a rite of passage, a coming of age. And uh, the parents said at this point, we release you. We're no longer responsible to God for your behavior. We'll take care of your room, your board, your all the, all the things. We're not, not being your parents, but as far as the consequences of your decisions that you make, it's now direct. We're now pushing you out on your own and releasing you to become fully accountable to God. Uh, When we do that, uh, it can either be taken very lightly, which often is, 13 is not a very mature age, uh, especially for a boy, it's probably radically immature. Uh, I think at 13, um, I I knew nothing about life other than (laughs) sports and I mean I didn't know anything about girls I didn't know anything about I I knew Hebrew school and you know that was it Uh, (laughs) I was pretty clueless Uh, but parents tend to blame themselves that's kind of a common pattern in this Mm -hmm. process is Mm -hmm. looking at what, what could I have done differently and that's a pretty slippery slope to go down as opposed to what you did in the book was you kind of took us through a narrative of the setting and the setup and the acknowledgement uh, when you finally found out, which was mm-hmm. a real crossroads for you. What was that like? What was yeah. that, that particular night like? when you found out that your son was doing, not just doing drugs, but he was doing heroin. Right, right. Yeah, that was a shock. We knew he was dabbling, and we'd put some parameters in place in light of that we were testing him. And, um, but still the idea that he would ever be foolish enough to try something like heroin was just uh, kind of out of our thoughts we just never really considered it so when we found out you know just utter shock and my mind immediately went to what did what did we do what did we what did we miss that sort of thing and you know honestly when we were raising kids when my husband and I were young with young kids um, there was sort of a Christian way of thinking about raising kids where it was sort of if you follow these rules 
your kid's going to turn out okay. So it was sort of like, if this, then that, you know, as long as you do this, as long as you have whatever devotionals and, you know, follow these discipline rules or whatnot, then, then everything's going to be okay. So at that point, my mind immediately went to, um, I must have messed up with one of these things I was told to do because I'd sort of been trained or had been, had read enough to, Uh, kind of like what you were talking about with the bar mitzvahs um, when in fact you know free will does exist it is there and um, it plays a huge part and and there's all sorts of factors too where a lot of times uh, kids will have almost almost always when it comes to heroin they'll have like a comorbid uh, diagnosis which means that you have something else that's underlying the um, addiction so anxiety, say, or depression, that sort of thing. And I don't think that that's an excuse at all. Um, I believe it really is a disease now. Uh, and some people might still disagree with me on that. But, you know, there are certain genetic make makeups, and this is biologically um, really studied quite a bit, that are make you more susceptible to addiction than other people. And so for one person, you know, they have some Percocet because they broke their leg, and they're fine. Another person you know, has that same Percocet and they need another one. They immediately another one need another one. In fact, my husband, it's interesting, he remembers being at a party in college and his friends were drinking and he was drinking um, and uh, he just kind of looked around and realized at a certain point, something's the matter with me. My, my friend stopped. I can't stop. I can't stop drinking. And it was a very, very different experience for him. And he knew, thankfully, immediately, just I can't, I can't drink like other people. And I got to stop now. So, and I don't understand that. Have no idea what that's like. I could stop and, you know, easily whenever I want to. So, you know, you can see certain things about certain people where it really is. You know, they are uh, in danger of becoming an addict to something. And, um, so I look at, I really believe that addiction is a disease, but I do think it's a preventable disease, right? So, you know, you don't do that first, you know, shot of heroin and you're not going to become addicted to heroin. So it is preventable. Um, of course, if you bring in the pharmaceutical issues of painkillers, opiate painkillers, that's a whole nother world because that's given to you. You're supposed to take it. Um, and sometimes you can't get off it. So anyway, uh, that's kind of where my mind went. I, yeah. You know, there's a lot of evidence for what you said about um, why two people can take the same medication and one, uh, mm -hmm. when it's gone, it's gone, and they never give another thought. And uh, before the third or fourth tablet is taken, they're thinking about, wait, I only have eight more. What am I going to do at the end of this? And they already go into that addictive response because they have that genetic mm -hmm. makeup. And so that plays a lot mm -hmm. in this area of what we would classify on the overall mental health. Is, is it mm -hmm. biological? Is it uh, psychological? Uh, is it a combination mm -hmm. of both? As, mm -hmm. as you and your husband uh, began to address the issue of our son is taking care of our precious baby, our sweetheart, our, mm -hmm. our, our, this, this, uh, one we've loved and we thought we trained well and he's made these decisions. How were your interactions with him and what did you find mm -hmm. that made him receptive as opposed to resentful or defiant? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm so thankful um, that he and my husband always had a very rela close relationship when he was a boy growing up. Um, and so that was definitely distanced when he started to get into a drug, but there was still a very much open conversation between them. And uh, our son wasn't uh, a kid that really tended to lie and that sort of thing, although he did end up lying at times. But I think that there had already been established a conversation there that was free where my son didn't feel any sense that he was going to be judged, you know, um, 
obviously uh, helped and rules would be set in place, but this sense of judging or, you know, yelling, that kind of thing just wasn't there. That's just kind of the way that my husband is and I am. So I think that that conversation that had always been open throughout his life, uh, you know, sort of allowed for him to not run away, you know, when we sat down with him for the most part. At what point did you begin to see that uh, his friends and others were struggling as well and needed a safe haven, and you became the home of uh, the Lost Boys of Peter Pan? <laughs> yeah, the Lost Boys. So um, that's just something God put in our laps. I think that, you know, same thing, since uh, our kids were very young, we just had an open house where kids would come here and play, and we tend to be a little bit laid back about things, so it made for an easy place for them to hang out and stay, uh, you know, and then when they got older, even staying late, later. So, in fact, it's interesting because at one point, um, this is far earlier than anything with our son happens, but... Uh, our daughter had a friend who was struggling, and she brought her over into the living room where, where my husband was and just kind of sat her down next to my husband and said, you need to talk to my dad. So it was kind of that sort of a thing where we would talk about, you know, philosophy, um, God, theology. Um, I used to do, you know, teach people to paint some of the, the kids how to paint, and I had an upstairs studio. So... It was just that kind of a home, and people started hanging out. And then over the course of time, more kids who had problems started hanging out and coming over. And my husband ended up having a Bible study. Uh, one night it was for kids who were still struggling with drugs. Another, another night was for kids who had really come out of that and were, you know, in a good place. So, and then because of that, some of the kids who really started walking with God brought their friends over and said, hey, you know, come over here. It's a safe place. You know, you're not going to be judged, but they are going to try to, you know, help you as much as possible. So was this before, during or uh, after your discovery with your son that you would begin ministering to other kids? That would have been before. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, um, you know, it, it makes sense to think that he started doing heroin because of the kids who are struggling here, but it really wasn't, wasn't that as much as, um, you know, his personality, he was familiar with what, you know, drugs and they were easy to get and that sort of thing. But in the end, he had a very serious overdose and it was his friends, uh, you know, who were staying here, who were around here, um, who saved his life, literally saved his life, and helped him when he needed help. And they actually made him sit down with us and tell us what he was doing. So, um, you know, at first glance, it probably looks like, oh, we were helping all these kids who were involved in drugs, and it's because of that that our, our son got, got involved in drugs. But, it, you know, it really wasn't like that. Your son overdosed. You were confronted with that. Yeah. How important was it that you held on to the helm of the garment of the one who died for you? Um, it was everything. You know, it was everything. Um, just the shock of having a kid. He wasn't expected to live. He went into septic shock. Um, so it wasn't usually when someone overdoses from heroin, you can just give them something called Narcan, Narcan and it right. wakes them up and, you know, revives them. So he wasn't like that. They weren't able to revive him. So he was on life support, support, uh, and wasn't expected to live. And, um, so it is this just overwhelming, just fear and sorrow. Um, and I remember just like, I can't control these feelings I want to die there so bad. And I remember uh, quite literally being in an elevator. This is the first time we were going to see him in the ICU after they brought him into the emergency room and stabilized him. We were in the elevator going up with some of his friends and my husband and I, and I remember looking up at the numbers and just all of a sudden having this revelation that uh, 
even if, uh, even if the worst happened, God is still with me. I'm still holding on to his garment, as you just said, and that I'll be okay. Everything will be okay, no matter what. And even if, meaning if, if my son dies, it will be okay, because that's the only assurance we have. You know, we need to trust not in what we want Jesus to do, but in Jesus himself. And that became what I held on to. Um, You learn a lesson like that. God teaches you, you know, you don't forget it. So that was that was a turning point. And not that I didn't still have anxiety. I had plenty, but I had to continue to go back to that. Of course. Um, Trusting Jesus. We're talking with Catherine James, author of the new book, A Prayer for Orion, A Son's Addiction, and A Mother's Love. Words no parent wants to hear from their child that they are on heroin or drugs or premarital sex or any of the long list of things that we as parents don't want to hear our children tell us. But as good parents, we open up lines of communications where our children can approach us. And the grace given to us is the grace that we're supposed to give to them. We have consequences before the Lord. There's certain consequences in life for our children. But this mother's love story is exactly that. It is a mirror image of the love that God has for each one of us. That we don't have to remain in the condition that we're in. If we will just take our scared hand and put it in his scarred hand, he'll pull us out. Was it faith? Was it modern medicine? Was it a mother's love that brought her son through? Where the initial chances were 20% and then they began to improve. And she can tell the story not having lost him, but having navigated through this to see it now from the other side. That's the story of a prayer for Orion. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions, preconceptions, belief systems that we've adopted how we are to engage with our children and not with our electronics and how we can create an environment where we can connect and pay attention and support each other and come together as a community of faith to help those that are struggling in a real struggle without condemnation, without blame, but with a loving hand of help. I'm going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. 
For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Catherine James, author of the new book, A Prayer for Orion, A Son's Addiction and a Mother's Love. Catherine, welcome back to the program. Thanks. Catherine, as you continue to interface with the doctors in intensive care, and your son is now in the throes of the um, overdose. The treatment given to him was, took him to uh, sepsis, infection throughout his body, ventilator, um, didn't look good. Mm -hmm. And the doctors were conveying to you. They were giving you percentages along the way. I think the first one you mentioned is like 20 to 30 percent chance of survival. Mm. What does that do to someone's faith when they are looking at this child that they had dreams for, that they had mm. invested what they thought was the best they had to give? a strong foundation of faith, yeah. uh, surrounding of love, of encouragement, and uh, there you sit looking on, at this point, a fairly lifeless, sick body, mm. consumed mm. by infection. Yeah. Where, where, yeah. Where's your faith uh, now? <laughs> it was rattled. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. For sure, it was rattled. But um, I also had this sense that the our only hope was Christ at that point. You know, it was just reflexive since I'd walked with God long enough to know that that was my only hope. And so first thing I did when I got call, the call that he wasn't waking up was to call a good friend who prays and told her to call anybody she knows. So we had people praying. Um, Honestly, we had people praying all over the world because one of the lost boys, one of the kids who was staying with us, his father was a pastor. And at that point, he was in the Philippines with a conference of pastors. And so he stopped the whole conference and had everybody pray. Um, you know, and thankfully, we had that support. So and then also uh, the lost boys, some of our son's friends came with us, you know, up that elevator where, you know, I was just terrified. And they sat in the room you know, the waiting room as we were waiting for them to get ready and so that we could see him. And uh, one of them just said, I think we should sing. So uh, he started singing when we all sang together and just prayed and prayed and prayed. And so 
from there, it was, you know, ups and downs. The doctor came out once, you know, there were a lot of different doctors involved. And he, you know, I said, what should we pray for? And he said, well, pray that his blood pressure would come up. His heart at that point was breathing, beating 14 times a minute. So we prayed for that. And within an hour or two, it did come up. He said that he had tried all the different medicines, but he was going to try one more to see if it would work. And it did. So there was that, you know, um, at a certain point, his heart started to fail and they couldn't figure out why it was failing. And it's interesting because and you know, there's a more medical term for it, but basically what it means is that when a heart goes into shock and it can be something like finding out a loved one is dead right. or a physical shock of some sort and the heart, uh, literally starts to swell and um, that's that's what can cause things to really really go wrong and in very rare cases it will actually burst so there's this pericardium that actually bursts the water out of your heart um, but his did eventually go down it's interesting too and i talk about this in the book <laughs> just a thought but you know if you think about it christ on the cross you know the soldiers stuck the spear in his side and water came out I think that's really interesting to think that, you know, Christ had a broken heart, you know, maybe he had that. Uh, so anyway, that, that was a, that was a big thing as well, but eventually 100% sure that it was prayer, um, God's grace towards us. And you know that that's not always the outcome. So, yeah. As parents navigate this discovery, and your discovery was kind of multi-phased. You saw some text messages that were kind of cryptic, but kind of gave you a, that sense of discernment that this is, not, this is not the communication style of my son. He's an articulate, mm. uh, not a street. Uh, you know, I've never heard him jive talk, if you would before and all of a sudden there's this real cryptic message uh do you want some i'm gonna get some and uh you start to see telltale signs and you have a sense that something's not right there's and then it all comes together and you have this discovery you respond to the discovery in the best way you know how but did you feel adequate to give mm. him the support that he needed? No, no, just flat out no. It, 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 I don't know that anybody would feel completely adequate, even somebody who is, you know, works in a rehab. It, it's every, one of the biggest things is everybody's so different. You know, there is no protocol. There is no, you know, do this, then this, then this. You know, every kid is so different. Um, so at that point, we really uh, just were, all we could do is pray. You know, that's all that was left to us. We didn't have anything else. Um, just wisdom and prayer and trying to navigate through these decisions. You know, two decisions, they look, both look great, but which one do we choose? That kind of a thing. Uh, so we started looking at rehabs. Uh, rehab, in my mind, was sort of the answer. <laughs> and it's frequently, almost always doesn't work right away at least. And so, you know, we did find one that was somewhat close by, but knowing our son and his uh, sort of underlying issues, he did run, he didn't stay. So, yeah, it was just kind of, okay, that didn't work, let's try another one. But the only sure thing, you know, I'm just gonna keep going back to it is prayer. You know, the only sure thing was Christ. Uh, I don't know how you handle it if you, if you don't believe in God because it would all be so random. Random, the thought that it was random kind of uh, really was unsettling to me. And so I had to believe that there was nothing random about it. And I know there wasn't. You have other children. What were, mm -hmm. what, what were the siblings, what was the family dynamic as the focus now became on your son, his addiction, this, this became a, um, uh, probably 
the nucleus of a lot of things that uh, became your, your center of life. How, how did he relate to his siblings and how did his siblings relate to him? Mm. Well, they'd always been close, but by that time he's our youngest. So one of his older sisters was in California by that time she'd moved. And then his other sister had uh, gotten married the previous month. So uh, they're all in different places right now. But um, the sister who had gotten married was living in D.C. And then she was coming up here for some training uh, for work. And so she So she played a big role, but I was sort of in this fog at the time, so I didn't realize until later what she had done to help. You know, she really had just, you know, driven my husband and I to the hospital, took care of things as best she could. She went to the hospital to sit with my son. Um, she called my other sister to tell her what had happened. So she was really, really involved in ways I had no idea. Um, and it was just really precious. Uh, but before this, you know, they'd all been very close. And I think that they did talk about this among themselves in ways that they probably didn't talk to my husband and I. And I'm so thankful for that, you know, that they have been close. For many, they would <clears throat> want to keep this a private matter. There's shame, there's guilt, there's um, you're in ministry. How is this going to reflect on you? Um, uh, it's, it's bad enough that we live in this bubble that everybody's looking at. Mm -hmm. Now they have something to look at. Uh, at least now we've given them something so they have to make things up. Uh, it's kind of where I was seven years ago uh, when I went through a marital betrayal. Uh, I said, well, you finally, uh, you've made things up for years. Now you're finding something real to talk about. So, you know, dig in, have at it, uh, put it on the menu, you know, talk mm -hmm. about it amongst yourselves. But, you know, at least this is at least real. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what resources? So you looked at rehab. Uh, mm -hmm. Did the church respond? Was there... <clears throat> Are there programs that people, other than NA and other programs that, um, was there anything that wound up being, <clears throat> excuse me, the most helpful, or was it the combination mm -hmm. of things, or is it kind of like um, starting with a diagnosis and every doctor treats every case of cancer differently. It's not like, okay, you have mm -hmm. this kind of breast cancer, this is the treatment, here you go. We have a vending machine, we put in the mm -hmm. diagnosis, it pops out the cocktail. There's a lot of things involved. <laughs> uh, did you find yourself being more of a counselor, confidant? Did you find yourself being a very devoted mother, reinforcing the message? There's Nothing you can ever do to make me stop loving you. Uh, hmm. Where was your strength? Where was your support? And where are we today in this situation? Right. Yeah, well, first off, our church was wonderful. Uh, what I said when I called my friend, uh, you know, to ask her prayer, I said, and she asked who she could tell, I said, just tell anyone that will really pray. You know, that's all I cared about. And I'm sort of an open book anyway. I think that it's easier for uh, people who are in sort of campus ministry or parachurch ministries than, say, a pastor. Because it's just, I don't know, if I think about a pastor and the congregation looking so immediately up to them uh, it, that it could be, you know, you really could have people look differently at him. He could lose his job, whatever. So it's a whole different thing that I don't really understand. But for us, we had a lot of support. And we also, you know, as soon as we were honest about what happened, we had people that, uh, even within our ministry, who'd gone through the exact same thing, who called us, told us about resources and that kind of thing. So, you know, there was the rehab. And from there, when that didn't work out, uh, really just I got into prayer groups. I, you know, was online 
friends told me places I could kind of reach out to as far as advice. And like you said, you know, every kid's different. And uh, for some kid, you know, a year long program would be great. And in fact, we had other kids who stayed with us who did end up going to, you know, great programs and they did really well there. Um, but our son actually suffered with anxiety uh, as far as just being anywhere. And honestly, I think home is, was the best place for him. And uh, a lot of, you hear about the, the term tough love and honestly it gets me really angry <laughs> because it's just, you know, Mm -mm. They need the exact opposite. Uh, being kicked out is is the worst possible thing you could do. Um, for most addicts, they're suffering through um, just the cycle of using um, guilt repeat. So guilt and shame is a huge part of their life. And what they need more than anything in the world right then is they need community. And studies have shown, too, that community is the best um, treatment community, however that comes about, real true community and acceptance, um, and so that's kind of the way we were. All right, where are we today? Where are so we, we, we? Yeah, where are we today? Yeah, today we're in a great place. You know, I think that for someone, for a parent who has a kid who's been involved with heroin, it's always going to be there. It's always just a little thing sitting on my shoulder that I'm afraid of, but uh, just constantly giving it to God. And every year that goes. You know, that goes on, I feel better about it and more grateful. Our son, you know, uh, getting married isn't, you know, the end all for Christians at all. I don't think every Christian needs to get married and have kids. But for our son, it was just a huge blessing. He got married about a year ago. Uh, they had a surprise baby about three weeks ago. Um, and he's doing, he's doing really well. He's still himself. You know, he's not, he's chill. He's not, uh, you know, one of these, we kind of always prayed that all of a sudden he was going to get excited about the gospel. Like, he, you know, have this great uh, revelation and all of a sudden Jesus would be the first thing in his life and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I felt like God really has led me to pray along the lines of, you know, slow and steady wins the race for him. And it has been like that, you know, just slow and steady, you know, but he's headed in the right direction, always going forward, never backwards. So. To the really parent thankful. who's listening now that uh, suspects or even knows that their child is involved with drugs, whether or not they're gateway drugs or whether or not they're hardcore addiction, what words would you say to them upon meeting them for the first time, even in the lobby, even in the waiting room, mm. what would you say to them? Gosh, I would say, first of all, you're not alone. There's an awful lot of us out here. There's a lot more information and help uh, there. Depending on your kid, there is, you know, medical help and there is prayer help out there. And then I would probably recommend a couple resources to them um, that should that will really kind of give them sort of some sort of traction. You know, you're not just kind of swimming out in, you know, in the air. Uh, there's one resource that I really like. It's called Hope for Hurting Parents. You can go there online and it's a, uh, a couple started, a friend of mine, and there's resources on there and stories and a blog and things like that. They had a daughter who really went uh, off the rails for a while. In fact, there was a movie made about her, uh, Renee Yohi. Uh, so there's that. Actually, I also have a book here that I really like. It's uh, Clean, Overcoming Addiction. Uh, there is a lot in there. It's by David Sheff, um, and this would be more of a lot of the technical stuff, you know, studies, things like that, uh, comorbid possibilities. So, How involved were you as we <clears throat> come to a close with your local physician, with your local psychologist, psychiatrist? What, uh, what did you get counsel while he was getting counsel? Yeah, uh, definitely. We had a good physician. We had we had a couple of physicians, um, some that were specialized more in the um, addiction things and what was available. I think for some of these kids, if they've gotten into things like heroin, what they need to do is sort of find a base where what their real issue is. So if it's anxiety, then they can be treated for that. But until they can kind of get off the heroin, really get stable mentally, then they can be diagnosed. But before that, it's a little tricky. So. Um, yeah. 
We've been talking with Catherine James, author of A Prayer for Orion, A Son's Addiction, and A Mother's Love. For many of you out there, someone you love is engaged in activities which you know are harmful. Whether or not it's addiction, or it's going to lead to addiction, or uh, a car accident, or failure, and shame built upon shame, standing by and doing nothing will not work. The action plan is prescribed by God. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all the rest of this will be given unto you. You are not alone if you choose to grab a hold of the one who grabbed a hold of you. And if you turn to the one who knows about the suffering of a son, and that's your Father in heaven. And if you pray diligently to ask the Lord what's the best way to reach. And if you are open and transparent, both in the home and outside the home, not that you're going to take out a billboard that says, I'm so proud of my son, he's a heroin addict, but to be real with the elders and the leaders of the church to say you need help. You need help so you can be equipped to help the one you love so much. Love never fails. Let me serve a God of love. But there's a struggle. A lot of our young people are dealing with it. Technology, isolation, comparisons, shame, shaming, bullying, all kinds of things we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis because we're busy in our lives, and we have no idea how it's impacting them. For some, their personalities can handle it. For others, it crumbles them, and they will do anything to stop the pain. God wants to do more with you. Involve him in these discussions. Ask for help. Get resources like this one. The Chronicles, really, a mother's love and how she endured, ministered to, opened their home, and found a gifting out of compassion, grace, mercy, and love without condemnation to help lift up, to be Aaron and her, for those whose arms were growing weary and they were losing the battle. They turned to the Lord and outside resources. A powerful story, a moving story, a transparent story, and one that will make you realize that you have the power within you, partnered with the Holy Spirit to rise up and take on any battle on behalf of your family and your children, just as you were called to do when God entrusted you with them. Catherine James, thank you. Thank you for writing thank a prayer you. for Orion. Thank you for being so open about this journey. And may the Lord put this in the hands of tens of thousands of families who are looking for answers I might find one right here in these pages. Catherine James, thank you. Thank you for being with us here Thanks on Revealing so the Truth. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.